Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Taylor McFarland. I am the Mama Dentist on social media, and I'm here with one of my first lectures in what I hope to be a series answering common questions about common dental things. And today's focus is going to be on teeth whitening. The things that we're gonna talk about are just basic tooth anatomy. What are the parts of the tooth? Where does that yellow color come from that people often complain about? And what types of discoloration are there? Causes of discoloration and the treatments? And then we're gonna define bleaching, what it even is, and then what different types exist. I'm gonna let you know a lot of thoughts about the viral hacks that are going around, especially on TikTok, and I'll answer some of the common questions. So first, teeth have three layers. There's enamel on the outside, dentin in the middle, and the pulp, which is the nerve and the blood supply. I've got a little picture on the next slide for you. The middle layer, the dentin, is what is yellowish in color. The enamel is semi-translucent, kind of grayish blue, um, but mostly clear. And so the color you see on your tooth is the combination of those two, that translucency of the enamel, but with slight grayish blue tinge mixed with whatever color that dentin is, which tends to be a yellowish brown. Healthy teeth do naturally appear kind of ivory to yellowish in color. They're not toilet bowl white. That is just kind of this westernized idea of what tooth health should be is super, super white teeth, and that's just not the case. Naturally, they are a little bit yellow, but many people want whiter teeth, and one of the most often sought reasons that people seek dental care in the first place is for discolored teeth. So let's talk about what are some of the different types of discoloration. So we kind of categorize them in two ways, either extrinsic or intrinsic. Extrinsic stains occur on the outside or the external surface of the tooth. Um, intrinsic stains, in contrast, they're on the inside and can be either in the enamel or the dentin, but most often the dentin is what is discolored. We're going to go through these individually, kind of extrinsic all together, and then intrinsic kind of point by point of what those are and then ways that we can potentially treat those conditions. And treatment for this discoloration can vary widely. There's not just bleaching. It depends on the cause, whether the staining is extrinsic or intrinsic, and then what caused the staining. What caused the staining is going to determine how we address it. And it ranges in invasiveness. You can have something really conservative, not invasive hardly at all, which would be just surface stain removal. And then you move on to bleaching and then something called microabrasion, where you're sort of sanding a tooth, getting rid of some micro porosities. And then there's bonding where you're removing tooth structure most of the time, but not as much as say when you veneer or when you crown, even beyond, I don't have crowning, full crowns past veneering, but that's the difference. A veneer is removing just very tiny surface level of enamel so you can bond some porcelain to it. Whereas a crown, like you see on TikTok, a lot of these people going to Turkey and doing vacation dentistry, getting veneers, they're not getting veneers, they're actually getting crowns where you're removing full millimeters worth of thickness from teeth. And that's very dangerous to do. Don't recommend doing that because when you remove more and more tooth structure, you get closer to the pulp or the nerve or the blood supply of the tooth. And that can make it more susceptible to sensitivity, to pain, to even the nerve dying, needing a root canal, and then having to have all the more dental work done. So first we're going to go through extrinsic staining. That is from your edibles. So things you eat and drink, mostly things that contain like tannins or organic molecules that are going to leave stain. Um, so coffee, dark soda, tea, and habits wise, especially tobacco, smoking, that's going to stain your teeth as well. And then hygiene. So we have different types of bacteria in our mouth. We have an oral microbiome in there, and some of them are more prone than others to leaving discoloration. So you will have chromogenic bacteria that sometimes leave a green color, an orange color, or a dark black color um, if they're eating things high in iron. And so based on what bacteria are present, if you're not cleaning those away, you could get black tartar, you can get black black, or any range of colors from those bacteria. So the three main extrinsic factors are just your diet, what you're eating, what you're doing, habits, and then hygiene. And we can address those most often in a very conservative way, just with a good cleaning at the dentist. If you have a lot of tartar buildup, sometimes that can be multiple appointments. They're going to have to use the sonic scaler to remove things, um, but that can, by and large, correct any discoloration from external staining, and you won't need much more than that beyond a cleaning. And then it's just home maintenance, routine, flossing, brushing to kind of keep that plaque buildup at bay. You can add in a habit like xylitol gum chewing or mints, um, that for several months, chewing several times a day. That can also reduce the number of bad bacteria in your mouth that might lead to more plaque buildup. And so that's a good habit to form as well if you're prone to lots of tartar and plaque buildup. Then I'll go through a few more things later like products that I like that might help too. Now, one of the things about extrinsic stains, those pigments that do stain can over time permeate through the tooth and get internalized. So these causative factors for extrinsic stains can also become intrinsic stains. So the tannins, those kinds of things in your coffee and your tea, they can also stain your dentin on the inside. Intrinsic stains by nature are a little bit more complicated because they're not as easy to access, right? They're inside the tooth. And so sometimes the treatment is different depending on the source of that stain. 
And we'll start first with aging because that does tend to be the one that is most common. Um, most often people complain about stains arising just as they're getting older. Their enamel is thinning. Their dentin also relatively is thickening because over time, just with micro traumas with time, our dentin puts down more um, to protect that pulp, that nerve on the inside. And so more dentin means more yellow color. Plus if you're getting wear, abrasion, erosion, any of these things that might take away enamel, you're not gonna have as much enamel there. So that color is gonna show through more. But this is also one of the things that's most often managed conservatively, typically just through bleaching. You can get veneers or crowns if it is more pronounced. You can't put enamel back. Um, so if it is the lack of enamel is the reason why you have this discoloration, you may be looking at something more like veneers, but typically bleaching is the way to go. You're just going to help that dentin to be a lighter color. For other intrinsic stains, there are hereditary conditions. So things like amelogenesis imperfecta, dentinogenesis imperfecta, where you have dark orange kind of mottled appearing enamel or the dentin is kind of grayish blue in color. And these are often very difficult to correct without something like crowns and veneers. Um, it is a genetic condition, so it will often run in families. People typically know, um, but it can be a new mutation, but typically people know um, that it runs in their families, and it is something that is often managed by a prosthodontist, which is a dental specialist who has extra training to treat multiple teeth at once, more complex bite issues, and things like that. And it often arises because the enamel is weak, and they end up losing or fracturing enamel, um, or the enamel is not even there to start with. And there are different types of amelogenesis imperfecta, things like that, that have varied appearances, but it tends to be the thinner the enamel, the more apparent you're seeing this discoloration of the dentin, or even if it's just normally colored dentin, it's more apparent, looks more yellow. And this kind of as an aside is one reason why dentists don't recommend whitening toothpaste, especially not being used every single day because whitening toothpaste are, their goal is to whiten externally, to remove extrinsic stain. But if it is strong enough to remove tartar from your teeth, it can be strong enough, especially if you have weakened enamel in any way, if there's any acid source that has weakened your enamel, so acid reflux, just from eating recently, things like that, you can actually wear your enamel away and then we just saw thinning enamel means you're going to see that dentin underneath. So you can actually, in using a really abrasive charcoal toothpaste that you found on Etsy, that who knows what abrasivity it is. It's actually quite abrasive, removes not just stains, but also your enamel. Your teeth will look more yellow. They won't look more white. So avoid the whitening toothpaste maybe once in a while as a maintenance to get some like external stain that's pretty heavy off between your regular visits, but I would not use it every day. And so for those hereditary conditions we were talking about earlier, um, that main way of managing those is through something like veneers or crowns. And that's something you often know or are aware of right when those permanent teeth are starting to come in, you can see that the enamel is not intact, is not normal, is starting to break down more than usual. And you can start to plan because this will be sort of a lifelong management cosmetically of those teeth and how to build a smile that the patient is happy and comfortable with. The next type of intrinsic stain is medications. Um, I'm going to lump fluoride in there. So when fluoride is ingested in excess while the permanent teeth are forming, and that tends to be for the front teeth that are visible between ages like zero and three, you can get something called mild fluorosis. And by excess, I don't mean like what's in formula. Fluoride is in formula. Um, not what's in water normally, not what's in food like teas. Lots of things have fluoride naturally, but it's like the kid that's eating the toothpaste or the parent that's putting a whole glob of toothpaste on their two-year-old's toothbrush. That is excess. So just as an aside, the safe amounts of toothpaste for children to have, because we know they swallow most of it up until age three, till they turn three, you only want to use a grain of rice size amount of fluoride toothpaste, but that is fine for a little baby that just gets their first tooth when they're six months old. You can use that grain of rice size amount. And then when they turn three, you can switch to a pea size amount. And after that, you don't need any more, even as an adult. That's all you need. So fluorosis happens most often from contaminated water sources. Places out in Colorado where there are well water sources that have really, really high levels of fluoride and people aren't aware they haven't tested their well water, they can end up ingesting a whole lot of fluoride that is taken into those developing teeth and you get what is called fluorosis. In its mild form, it kind of looks like this. It has little white flecks or white specks, but it can be, if very severe, really mottled and browned enamel. So that is fluorosis and that tends to be managed based on its severity. It can be bleaching just to try to even out the color between the very bright white spots and then the tooth. It can also be microabrasion. It can be veneers even ultimately or crowns if necessary if it's more severe. Tetracycline staining is a common form of intrinsic stain that people talk about. It is less common now because we know that tetracyclines, a certain type of antibiotics, lead to when taken during the time that those permanent teeth are developing pretty severe staining. And it's a very hard stain to get rid of. It is tenacious even with bleaching. 
Often they will recommend something called non-vital bleaching, where they do root canals on the teeth, bleach them internally, and that sometimes can help. But then you have all the complications that root canals can bring because the teeth may be more brittle. They will need crowns to hold them together. And so a lot of times people end up opting for veneers or crowns with the teeth still alive, not doing that non-vital bleaching technique and that will help mask that color but it tends to be like a greenish a really dark may maybe even blue gray color and it's hard to mask and that is tetracycline staining and there are some other things that will cause internal staining that i didn't address here like chemo radiation can sometimes impact the color and often it is a similar management veneers crowns and this was fluorosis um, another type of conservative treatment i forgot to mention before when i was kind of going didn't follow my slides is what is called icon resin infiltration and it is a type of conservative bonding where bonding is like gluing a plastic type material like a filling material to the tooth icon actually etches out some of that mineral so you use a really strong acid to etch out some mineral and then you bond in a very thin resin layer you're not actually doing a filling but you're bonding in just this little bit of resin into those micro porosities to even out the color it is a great option for fluorosis and also for those little white stains i'm going to go in that happen around braces brackets for like early cavities that remineralized and we'll talk about it there too and then microabrasion is just where they're kind of creating these little micro porosities smoothing out the tooth and that can sometimes help with the discoloration of fluorosis as well so now we'll go into hypoplasia what hypoplasia is is enamel that did not form ideally it's a little bit weak. Often they look sort of orangish in color, very chalky, very brown, and they can be very weak. There's a condition called molar incisor hypoplasia, and we're just learning more about kind of its origins. It's not necessarily trauma related, and um, it may have a genetic component, but you'll see like the second primary molars are impacted, and then as the six-year permanent molars and the incisors come in of the permanent set, they're impacted too, and they're like chalky and kind of weak. Sometimes they can be really sensitive teeth, and that's something that you want to manage with a dentist, um, perhaps a pediatric dentist, or even a prosthodontist that is familiar with that condition. It's called MIH or molar incisor hypoplasia. But when you have just single tooth or two teeth hypoplasia, it is most often from causes like trauma where the baby tooth, it sits in front of the permanent tooth that's forming. And if they bump that baby tooth, the root can push down into that forming crown of the permanent tooth and it can leave a little indentation or a little weak spot in that enamel or hypoplastic area. That's called a Turner's tooth. Dr. Turner um, was a dentist that noted that phenomenon. And that's a really common thing if you start looking at kids once masks are gone in the grocery stores and um, you'll see those little spots on single teeth in the front and they're just little hypoplastic areas of enamel. They often can be managed similarly with like icon, microabrasion, I'm um, even just monitoring and they're kind of developmental slash trauma in nature. And then the other cause is sometimes from high fevers. So if kiddos have really high fevers while their six-year molars are forming, our six-year molars start forming from birth. So you can end up having hypoplastic enamel on those six-year molars for a kid that say had repeat ear infections and had multiple high fevers and that impacted that enamel formation and it's kind of weak and that's separate from molar incisor hypoplasia, a little bit different, um, but that's another common cause of hypoplasticity. And then more rarely it can impact the front teeth too. And so you have kind of the same thing that we're going to talk about here, which is the option of icon resin, conservative bonding, sometimes maybe small fillings, even you'll take out some of that defective enamel and then put in a filling. Although I am of the opinion that really there's nothing better for your tooth than your natural tooth structure. So as conservatively as possible that you can manage one of these conditions, the better. Um, if my kiddos and none of them have their permanent front top teeth yet, but if they end up having a little spot from a Turner's tooth, I would do something without drilling. I would try not to put a filling in as much as I could. I would do like bleaching. I would do microabrasion do conservative bonding like icon resin that's not a true filling where you're not using a drill on the tooth before I would move to doing a filling. So it's something to think about in your options if you do have a tooth like that and you're looking at what to do. The next area we're going to talk about with the intrinsic stains is decalcification. So that is what I was talking about, those little white spots around braces brackets. So when you have plaque that sits on a tooth for a long time, our teeth go in flux with this cycle. If you've seen my other course about healing cavities, the truth about healing cavities, it's all about this, the balance between between demineralization, so the acids in your saliva that come from bacteria, that come from your diet, that are leaching mineral out of your tooth, the calcium and the phosphate, and then balancing the remineralization, those minerals going back in. You get hydroxyapatite back in that tooth, and you shift 
toward demineralization. Too much acid, the plaque sits there too long, you're not brushing well. That's often the case with braces. The plaque sits there, it's really hard to keep clean, and you get these little white spots. And that is the start of a cavity, the earliest stage where the minerals leached out, but the enamel scaffold is still intact. That is when we talk about it's possible to heal the cavity. You can put mineral back in with a really concentrated prescription fluoride toothpaste, with nanohydroxyapatite, with all sorts of different things, dietary shifts, hygiene improvements. You can get remineralization where it will be a smooth spot again. There won't be a hole there, but you'll have this white scar. Sometimes it can be like a darker, a black scar too, but typically it's white and looks like this. And that is kind of the consequence of an early cavity. But the good news is you did heal it. It is not going to progress. It's not actively growing. It's what you would call arrested, but there is that aesthetic scar there that we have to manage. And one of the best ways to manage that is with that icon resin infiltration. A lot of people have great success with that after braces if they have some of that white scar, early cavity demineralization staining. And then microabrasion is another option sometimes depending on the microporosity, that kind of thing with that staining. So the whole reason you probably brought this course is to learn about whitening. And the main way of whitening is bleaching. But what is bleaching? What is it even doing? In bleaching, you're trying to get the color of the tooth lightened and that's done by applying a chemical to the tooth that oxidizes the organic pigments that have been internalized. Those pigments from the edibles, from your food, from your drink, from your wine, tea, the tannins, those kind of things. You want to oxidize them and that's going to make your tooth appear lighter. Typically this chemical is hydrogen peroxide. Carbon peroxide is another one. Due to its molecular weight that allows it to pass through the enamel because the enamel is permeable and that is where it can reach those pigments in the dentin or in the deeper enamel. Now bleaching can be done in a dental office. It can be done at home with a product that's prescribed by your dentist, or it can be done at home with just over-the-counter whitening products. And the cost effectiveness and then the time required varies across all three, depending on what you're after in terms of time, in terms of effectiveness, in terms of cost. So in-office bleaching obviously is going to be one of the most expensive, but also the fastest routes. It may take multiple sessions to get the desired level of whitening. So a lot of people think it's like one and done, and it may not be. This type of bleaching uses the highest strength bleaching agents, typically in the range of 30 to 35% hydrogen peroxide. And they also use lights. Light itself isn't doing anything. It's just the heat that it generates that accelerates the reaction, that oxidation reaction. And then sensitivity is very common with these because you're light whitening so quickly at such a high strength, but it tends to be transient. And often people are fine after a few days. There's no research showing like long-term damage from bleaching, but the sensitivity can be very uncomfortable for people. And there is a risk of gum irritation. So all of these, they can damage or burn your tissues. So they do isolation. When they do this in the office, they're gonna put a rubber dam on, or they're gonna put some putty around your gums to protect them. The next level down kind of is the at-home bleaching with trays and that's where you're using dentist prescribed gels or pastes they're typically like half is concentrated like 15 percent it typically is carbon peroxide not hydrogen peroxide and then they're applied with custom fitted night guards so those little clear trays that they make to fit just perfectly around the edges of your teeth to not go onto your gums so that you don't get any bleed over of that material onto your gums because again it can be very irritating to your gums it's more likely your gums will be irritated because some will kind of push out with this type of methods so you have to be pretty careful with application, not doing too much. And then they can still be sensitive. A lot of people like to do these overnight, but because you're wearing it so long, your teeth can be pretty sensitive after. So that's something to consider too. And the cost is significantly less. And then the cheapest option, the slowest option, but still a viable option is using over-the-counter whitening gels and strips. Those tend to be like crust white strips, things like that. And they're on the order of like five to 10%. Um, I don't think they're allowed to be more than 10% concentration of hydrogen peroxide. And whitening does take longer. Um, it's less pronounced, but it can still be adequate to meet most people's desires. And that's often the route we recommend people go at first um, after they've had a good cleaning and they still want a little bit of whitening. Gum irritation is more likely just because it's like a strip. It's not shaped to your teeth. So you do have to be careful there. You aren't going to be wearing something like this for more than like 30 minutes to an hour. That's I think the longest that they direct. And sensitivity is still possible. Um, I am someone that gets sensitive even from just the white strips. So you will adjust your wear time, maybe skip a day based on that. Okay, now let's go into the TikTok hacks because that's what you all really want to know, right? That's what you tag me in. <laughs> like, is this legit? So let's talk about some of the most common ones. Melamine foam, we're using a Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. That's pretty old. It's 2022 now when I'm recording this. This was like 2020, 2021. But there is no what I would call medical grade melamine foam. And there are people out there that are like, there's this study that was done and they're gatekeeping this great material because it's abrasive, but it's really low abrasivity. It's not going to harm your enamel. And sure, that may be true for the one tooth in the study that they did on Binge Top with the melamine foam 
but that is not in clinical conditions. Your mouth is sometimes acidic. People have different pH levels of their saliva. You don't know if that enamel will not be worn away in the clinical environment. So I do not recommend doing this trend. And moreover, these are cleaning products, not mouth cleaning products, house cleaning products. So we don't know if they have been purified. A good example for comparison would be super glue. So super glue is now something that is made in medical grade. It is called Dermabond. And though, yes, you could use super glue to glue a cut together and have probably a similar outcome to Dermabond, there are also caustic chemicals in super glue because it's intended to glue plastics, not on your body. Um, there are caustic chemicals that can lead to cancer. And so we don't know that melamine foam is pure. You're putting this in your mouth. I know you're not swallowing it, right? They're like, Linda, don't swallow it. Well, the thing about your mouth, much like other mucosal sites in your body, is that it absorbs things and it has what is called first pass metabolism that it skips. So when you digest something, it goes from your gut to your bloodstream to your liver and it's detoxified. That does not happen when things are absorbed through your mucosa, through your nose, through your mouth. And so when it is absorbed just directly into your bloodstream, it's in your bloodstream. It's not being detoxified. And so you want to be really careful what you're putting in your mouth, that it's not just like random stuff like melamine foam. So don't do this one not worth it. Next is lemon juice. You see this often in just little concoctions that people share all these different things. You can mix, you know, cucumber water and lemon and coconut oil. And it all varies. It's all different. And the big thing to watch is that you're not using an acid. Lemon is a really strong acid, lemon juice. And so citric acid is the acid that's in there. You don't want to put that on your teeth because if you've watched my other course again, you've listened to me talk on social media, acid is what is demineralizing our enamel and taking out that mineral. So if you are putting acid on your teeth, especially if you're leaving it there for for lengthy periods of time, you could be doing harm. So do not use any hack, any recipe that has acids in it, lemon juice being the most common one, but all fruits are mildly acidic. So is vinegar, so apple cider vinegar, any kind of vinegar, that's an acid too. So no vinegar, no fruits, okay? Next, coconut oil, and it'll often be blended with an abrasive. So baking soda or charcoal, or I've seen crushed up shells or bones, like there's all sorts of very interesting ones sold on Etsy, and I do not recommend them because like we talked about with charcoal toothpaste, you don't know the abrasivity of that thing that they're adding to that oil. And their goal is to whiten via removing those external stains, but anything strong enough to remove something like tartar is going to also be strong enough to harm or scratch your enamel. And so I do not recommend doing something where you are not sure that it is not overly abrasive. So stick with products made by big companies that don't want to be sued because they strip your enamel off versus a little shop on Etsy. You don't know, okay? So do not use something with like bentonite clay, with charcoal, because you just do not know how mm. abrasive that is. Next up, we'll talk about essential oil. Now, essential oils are kind of claimed to cure all sorts of conditions, but one big thing about essential oils is they are not to be taken internally. And then we talked earlier about the melamine foam. You don't want these directly on your mouth unless it is in a specifically studied, investigated quantity like in mouthwashes or in toothpaste that use these. They have measured the amount, they get purified products, and that is something I think is fine if you're buying a product from a company and not just like some random person mixing it in their kitchen off Etsy, but like from a company that has a reputation that doesn't want to be sued, that's going to be doing a good job with their products. But they use very specific oils that have been studied that do seem to have a benefit to be used in the mouth. And you can't then take at home that same, you're like, oh, this mouthwash has peppermint oil. I'm just going to put peppermint oil with my coconut oil and mix it together. It'll be fine because you don't know the purity of that oil, what type of oil that company was using. It's just not something that I would recommend doing on your own. Again, because they can be caustic to the tissues, they can cause burns, and then you're you're also getting that absorption. And if you're not 100% sure that there are no impurities in that oil and homeopathy, those types are not regulated. When they've done studies, they do find lots of contaminants in them. It is not something that I would be putting in my mouth. But are there any hacks? Is there something that you can do that's kind of cheap, kind of easy that you can whiten your teeth? There are some things, but they're not quite as catchy. They're not going to go viral on TikTok. But one of the quickest and easiest is to use optics to your advantage. So go get a suntan, darker skin around your mouth, using a darker lipstick, darker foundation that is going to make your teeth in contrast, look brighter. Blues also contrast nicely with yellows and make them less apparent. That's why you see whitening mouthwashes that are like blue tinted. So you can get like a blue family type of dark lipstick and that will make your teeth look whiter. You can also dehydrate or desiccate your teeth. So just dry them off before a picture and dry enamel looks whiter. So that's a really quick and easy hack for a little bit whiter teeth before a photo. <laughs> 
<laughs> You'll just look a little funny as you're doing it. <laughs> Clean teeth that are also free of plaque and tartar will also look whiter. Most of the time our teeth look more yellow because they've got plaque built up on them. And so there are toothpaste out there that can help with your teeth appearing whiter. The one that I like for removing tartar and keeping tartar from building up again is called Tartar End. And then they're also finding with nanohydroxyapatite toothpaste now, which is kind of the more trendy thing um, if you are looking for fluoride alternatives. Although the toothpaste I love has both. It's the only one of its kind that I know of that does this. And it's made in the US. It's called Carry Free, but nanohydroxyapatite because it is smaller than fluoride, which is working with the hydroxyapatite already in your mouth, which is micro, so it's bigger. Nanohydroxyapatite can fill in these micro porosities in your enamel and then make it just appear brighter and whiter. So two easy hacks just to change with your toothpaste would be using tartar end and carry free. I tend to do the tartar end first for the full two minutes. Then I get carry free after like I brush, rinse, spit, and then I use carry free afterward for a quick final rinse. And then I just spit and let that sit on my teeth for like the rest of the night or the rest of the morning until I go down and get breakfast. I brush before breakfast. Um, but those are two things that you could try. Neither of those pastes have the ADA seal. And that is because of those two um, ingredients that I list on the bottom. Nanohydroxyapatite, it is not yet something that's accepted by the ADA as anti-cavity. They're still doing clinical-based research on it. And then tartar end has something called dimethyl isosorbide. And that's something that's not yet been studied by the ADA either. So there is something in it called sodium chloride. And that is accepted for like bad breath help. And that toothpaste does help a lot for me. I found with my morning breath, like bad breath is amazing. And I think it's doing something to shift our bacteria to be more aerobic instead of anaerobic. So that may be an added bonus that you notice, but it still, it has not been proven to the claim of anti-tartar linked to that ingredient. It hasn't been proven by studies. So it's not yet with that ADA seal, but I consider them both safe pace and effective pace. You're not getting rid of fluoride. You can keep fluoride in your routine. You just brush with the tartar end first. So those are some great pastes that you could try out if you wanted to. Now I'll go through some common questions that people often have. Why won't my dentist bleach my teeth first. Whitening is the reason I came in. Why won't they do it? A lot of people get annoyed at this, right? Like why can't they bleach them first? Well, because whitening is cosmetic, it really should only occur after you get the mouth healthy. So if you have a gum disease or cavities going on, you need to address that first, just for the overall health of your mouth. Those peroxides, again, remember our enamel is permeable, but if you have a cavity there, it's all the more permeable. Your gums can be irritated, right? But they're going to be all the more irritated if they're already infected, if they already have gingivitis. So you want to manage those conditions first, just for your safety before pursuing something like bleaching. A good cleaning is also wise. You want that done first to get all the plaque tartar surface stains off. And a lot of times people find that doing that good deep cleaning, having that done first is enough. And the whitening effect is enough that they don't then need to pay more money and have bleaching done. Another common question is, will my crowns or fillings have to be redone if you bleach your teeth? And it really depends on where they are, how visible they are, and to what degree you're bleaching. But materials, restorative materials, like filling materials, like crowns, they do not bleach. Their color does not change. So if you've got a single front tooth and you want to get toilet bowl white teeth and that one is more natural in color, more yellowish, you're going to have to change the color, have that crown replaced. Now, what products can I use to whiten at home? Over-the-counter ones like Crest White Strips are the most popular, most common. There are lots of little brands you'll find featured on Instagram here and there, but Crest is kind of tried and true, been around for a long time. That's what I use if I end up wanting one. They vary in strength and that's not easily found on the box. You do have to Google and you can find just like strengths of Crest at home whitening and you can get whichever level you want to try first. If you're looking for a pretty strong one, look for the 10%, but they have some that are like really gentle that are more like 6%. And I just want you to know that over-the-counter whitening products are treated like a cosmetic, just like toothpaste is. So it is not approved as like a medical device the same way that whitening products in a dental office would be. And that's not to say that they're any less safe. They're just treated differently by the FDA. So just be careful that that does make it a little bit easier. Anybody and everybody can make a whitening product. It doesn't go through the same regulatory process as something that you would find in a dental office. I would be sure when you're looking at over-the-counter products to avoid anything that has acids in it, as we talked about, those can damage enamel. There are a lot of Instagram accounts out there scaring people about hydrogen peroxide too, that you're harming your teeth, but no studies to date have shown that. When hydrogen peroxide is used by dental professionals or used at home, there are transient impacts. So you have some sensitivity, but that is not long lasting. That sensitivity can be profound and it really scares people, but it is transient. It goes away. It doesn't endure. Um, so there are no studies showing long-term impacts. Otherwise we wouldn't have these products anymore. People would be suing it. It wouldn't be going on. So it is safe if you want to pursue whitening via hydrogen peroxide. Are there alternatives though, if you do want to look at them? One of the most common ones I see all over my Instagram, at least is Lumino. I actually bought them. I'm going to try them for a TikTok review. So you can watch for that coming up sometime, maybe in the next few months this fall in 2022. 
Um, but they often use essential oils, mostly that lemon, orange. They're looking for a compound called D-limonene. And Lumino is the most well-known one that I know of. And people swear by it. The nice thing is it does not create that sensitivity reaction that hydrogen peroxide does. I mean, I'm curious myself just how effective it is or is not. But that is something that you could check out. Baking soda is another common method. And that's in lots of toothpaste too. And I think as long as you're using it kind of like a whitening toothpaste, not every day, just once in a while, because it may be more abrasive, you're doing okay. And then a lot of people want to know, okay, I'm going to bleach. I know it's going to be sensitive. Is there anything I can do? You can take over the counter analgesics. If you are allowed by your doctor to take those, that typically helps enough. And then also nanohydroxyapatite. One of the things we're finding in these studies that we are starting to do is that nanohydroxyapatite, because it is a smaller molecule, it's able to penetrate more deeply and clog up these dentin tubules, which are the pathways in the dentin from the outside of the tooth to the inside where water passes and you have like osmolarity gradients between sweet and salty, things like that. Whenever you have the dentin exposed, that's when you get sensitivity. And because it's so porous, these molecules are getting in there and activating these dentin tubules and your nerves are signaling and firing off. Well, the nanohydroxyapatite closes those back up. So they're no longer open, no longer sensitive. And that it can be really effective at reducing sensitivity. A lot of dental offices are even doing nanohydroxyapatite treatments after intense whitening sessions. So get yourself some nanohydroxyapatite toothpaste, carry free. Again, it's my favorite brand. I'm not an affiliate of them. I don't even have a discount code or anything from them. Even though I love them, they're just a small company um, founded by a dentist back in 2004. They've been around a long time working in oral care products and they still offer fluoride in their formulation, which I like. I don't want to get rid of fluoride. I think it's very helpful. So that is one thing you can pursue if you have whitening plans coming up and you don't want to deal with the sensitivity. People want to know how much does it cost? Dental care for most of us is pretty expensive. And even if you have insurance, whitening is often cosmetic and not covered, but it can vary widely. A lot of offices will have like discount plans. You can even ask about membership plans before you sign up for your next dental insurance. Dental insurance, I can go on. I have some TikToks about it. It's a bit of a scam. It doesn't cover very much. And for what you pay, depending on your employer, you may pay more to the insurance company than you even would get in coverage. And a lot of offices now have in-house dental members plans where you pay 20 bucks a month, 30 bucks a month, and you get free cleanings and you get discounts on whitening and whatever. And that may be cheaper than what you would pay to your insurance and you'll get better coverage because it's cutting out the middleman. So look in if you have a favorite dental office to an in-house membership plan and they may have little deals on whitening. Um, you can often find deals on like Groupon and stuff for dentists too for whitening, but it runs around a thousand bucks for a whitening session with a dentist, a professional whitening session. Take-home trays are more on the order of like hundreds of dollars because you do have to have an appointment still and impression. They send off to a lab, make that custom tray for you. They fit it, try it on. There are lots of steps involved, still some chair time. And that's what you're paying for is the time in the chair at the dentist. And then over-the-counter treatments, obviously cheapest, and they tend to run like 40 to 50 bucks. The Lumino, I just bought those off Amazon. It was about $50. All right. So how do you keep them white? after you bleach. Some of the little hacks you've probably seen are drinking through a straw is one, you're trying to minimize the amount of time that the things that have the tannins, those organic pigments in them are touching your teeth. So you wanna rinse with water afterward if you can. If you're drinking wine, try to swish with some water. I do that with my coffee. I like drink my coffee, drink my diet soda, and then I swish with water. So kind of rinsing away any of those pigments off of your teeth so they're not staying for a while. You can try and hold your straw as far back as you can. Then you're not gonna enjoy your drink as much, but kind of not even let it touch your teeth but get it to the back of your throat. But then again, it's like, why are you drinking it if you're not even tasting it? So I don't really do that. I do straw drinking, but I don't think it's impacting as much because it's still touching my teeth, but I do swish with water after. Don't want to sip for a long time either. So a short duration of time, ideally, if you can, for how long you're drinking these types of drinks. And then good hygiene is also going to help. If you don't have plaque buildup because plaque is really tenacious, it's really sticky, and so is tartar. I'm tartar you can't even remove on your own. But if you have good home hygiene, you're getting rid of that, it's not going to hold those organic pigments within it and then let them rest and then permeate into your tooth. So good hygiene is going to help too. And then you can, if you have something like custom trays or you just get these little white strips, in between visits because a bleaching from a dental office, they say with good maintenance, will last like one to three years. You may push it a little bit longer or more toward that three-year range by doing little touch-up sessions at home, maybe with like an over-the-counter one once a year, something like that. And so here's what a lot of people want to know. The reason maybe you bought this course is because someone convinced you that you need to bleach your teeth. And I hope as you heard me kind of insinuate in the beginning, you realize that our teeth are naturally kind of yellow. So if it will make you feel better about yourself, it's something that you want to do. There is no external pressure. Yeah, you can bleach your teeth and there are ways to do it that we talked about. But a lot of times I think when people realize, oh, like this dentist, I hold up a white card from my photography days. I hold it up to my teeth and you see that my teeth are yellow. That's normal and they're healthy. They can be healthy and slightly yellow. That is freeing for a lot of people. And I think they kind of drop this westernized beauty standard and realize, 
I'm just fine the way I am. And that's my message and all of my content is that you are worthy. You are worthy of love just the way that you are. Your teeth are beautiful just the way that you are. Um, and if you want to change them, you can. But if you have one crooked tooth that juts out and you don't want braces, you don't need braces. And if you have yellowish teeth and you are happy, you can let them be yellow, right? Because honestly, they're probably more natural in color than most of the people out there who are getting super, super white teeth. I don't bleach my teeth. I like my teeth out there. They're kind of yellowish and that's okay by me. So do you need to bleach? That is a personal decision. It's up to you. But most of the time you don't have to. It's just if you want to. Thank you guys. Thanks for watching. I hope this was helpful. I hope it wasn't too long and rambly or confusing. This is my first lecture like this. If you liked it, instead of just me sitting and talking to a camera, that was how my healing cavities course is. I'm thinking of redoing that as a lecture like this. If it was helpful, please let me know. Would you go find me on TikTok, on Instagram and comment, hey, I bought your lecture. I really loved this. I didn't like this. You can also email me, Taylor, that's my first name, at themamadentist.com. Just let me know. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for being here. And please let me know via an email what you want me to teach about next. Thank you.